Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, session and yet another interesting talk on JWST. Uh, so First of all, I thank you all to come to IAA for this open day. I hope you all are enjoying this and also staying it uh, or staying all along for this talk. Uh, this is something that IAA has done, first time done at this scale, at this grand scale. And uh, um, so coming to the talk, today's speaker is going to be uh, Professor uh, Maheshwar Gopinath. He's a scientist at Indian Institute of Astrophysics. He works in the area of interstellar medium and star formation. And today is going to talk about JWST. JWST, as you know, is James Webb Space Telescope, six meter class telescope, which is uh, launched last year, or 2021, December. And this telescope is considered as marvel of human ingenuity because uh, this was perhaps the most complicated space mission ever launched by any space agencies. So it's not just the telescope, but also the host of instruments that it carries to the space. So the idea of today's talk is to just give you the glimpses of this telescope, what are its potentials and what are, what kind of instruments that this telescope has. So Maitre Gopinath uh, would tell you more about it. So let me welcome him for this talk. And I So we have decided to take the questions only after the talk. So the talk is going to be for 40 minutes, and after that, you can ask the questions. All right, Mahesha. Yes. Thanks, Ravi. So as um, uh, Ravinder has just now said, I do extend my thanks to all of you for coming here and it's a pleasure to tell you what we do here and also what is happening elsewhere in the world. So today I'll be just talking about, you know, JWST or James Webb Space Telescope. It has been in news and it's going to be in news for, for I think, for some time. So uh, there was a very good talk by uh, uh, Ramya. Even though it was in Canada, she has touched upon many fundamental things, but let me just reiterate again for my uh, very young uh, uh, friends. So you know that the, you know, what we, the, the information that we get from Okay, so information that we get from the celestial sources are basically the light. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to do all, you know, uh, all those things by which we can collect the information from this light and talk about what is happening in these uh, celestial objects. Now, if you, if you talk about the information that is basically the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is the, the, the wavelength range that we talk about. At one end, you have gamma rays, and at another end, you have the radio. And this is sort of giving you an idea of you know, the, the scales of the wavelength that we are talking about. At one end, you have these set of subatomic partic particles, and on the other hand, you have you know, the, the scale of, uh, of Mount Everest. 
So as uh, Ramya also suggested that if I take, you know, the primary mirror size, so mirror size, when I say of telescope, it is the primary mirror, which is the diameter of the main mirror, which collects the light. So if I take that in the x-axis, then the diffraction limited image size, what you see from that telescope is basically, you know, it goes as uh, what is written in the, in the y-axis. So you can see that it is about 10 raised to minus two. Uh, it's half second. Half second is the, the angle that is substance in the sky. So you can see that as you increase the diameter of the telescope, um, you can get very precise or very sharper images. So basically that's the reason why we always go for bigger and bigger uh, primary mirror sizes. And this red is for the redder wavelength and blue is for the blue wavelength. So if you go into the bluer wavelength, that is an ultraviolet, then your images will be much, much sharper than when you see it in the, in the red. For example, uh, one of the ultraviolet uh, satellites which was working uh, in the past, it's called Galax. It it uh, images, uh, you know, the the sky in the ultraviolet wavelength. Now, if you look at that, you can see a, a, a region in the Andromeda galaxy to be very fuzzy, right? And when you take the same thing in with uh, UVIP, that is the uh, uh, one of the telescopes that are there in the AstroSat, our first satellite. I think the model you have already seen downstairs. Now, if you look at it, that it is something you know, reasonably sharper. But if I use, so this is about 35 centimeter, uh, you know, the diameter of the mirror. Now, if I make it one meter, then definitely that will be like much sharper, okay? So our next generation telescope, which is going to be a one meter class, that's what we are thinking to put it in the space, that will give you much sharper images than what we already have. Now, to illustrate it better, if you look at uh, a galaxy through 2.4 meter telescope, this is a simulated image basically. So you see it as very fuzzy. But if you go to 12 meter telescope, then be much, much sharper. So the point that I want to drive here is that this is the reason why we go for bigger and bigger aperture telescopes. Now, uh, if we have a light source and if you pass it through prism, then you get a continuous spectrum, basically, you know, splits the light into all the wavelengths. But if you have a hot gas, for example, a hydrogen gas, you keep it, and then you pass it through a prism, then you get, then you get a lot of emission lines. That is because, you know, this is a hot gas, and that will have the characteristics lines that, that can be given by that gas. But if I keep a cool gas in front of this hot source, then instead of emission line, what you get is the absorption line. So there will be many lines in the continuum spectrum. So if I if I take you know stellar image and then do a, a, a you know study it through spectroscopically, then what I get is all these lines, and that will tell me about the about the gas or about the source itself that is emitting the light. So, but the problem is that fainter the source you need to, you know, the collect that is light coming from those painter sources. So you need anywhere bigger of the Now, if you look at the stars, so uh, I, I think you you might know that if, if, if you have a, a temperature, if a source which is at a temperature T, then it can give you radiation in all, all the wavelengths. And the peak of this, this is uh, characteristic of the temperature of the, of the, of that source. So if I look at the temperature of, you know, look at stars which are at different temperatures, then their total energy that is emitted by these sources are going to be different, okay? So the, the bluer one will have a higher luminosity than uh, a K-type uh, or, or a very cool type star. This is something like that of our, our sun. But on top of that, so this very smooth, uh, you know, distribution, on top of that, there can be these absorption lines so if you look at the sun spectrum, you will have all these Fraunhofer lines. That lines are basically coming because of the material or element that are present in the sun itself. Now, if I get the surface temperature of, of the stars, and if I get the luminosity, luminosity is nothing but the energy that is given out by a source per second. Basically, it is losing the energy, right? So 
So if I if I calculate this luminosity basically from the intensity that I calculate from the say imaging and uh, surface temperature either from photometry or from spectroscopy, then I can put the stars in in what is called HR diagram, and then this will tell me how the star is in its evolutionary stage. For example, if it is if it is burning hydrogen at the center, then they will be following in this this uh, you know. Uh, curve, but if they evolve out, that is, if they cease to burn hydrogen at the center, then they move out. So, by looking at these diagrams, by calculating what is the light that is coming from these stars, I can understand what type of star is that, what is its evolutionary stage, what is its age, etc. Now, it's not only stars in the, in the, in the galaxy or in, in the universe, but there are these, you know, what is called molecular cloud. Now, the, the, the thing about this, these sources are that if you look at, in, look at these sources in the visible light, they all will be like, you know, patches in the sky. So, it's as if they are holes in the sky. But if you, if you take the same cloud and take picture in, in longer wavelength, you see that, the, you know, the, the cloud is almost disappeared. That's basically because the material by which this cloud is made up of is actually you know, not interacting with the wavelength. So wavelength is bigger than the particle size which are there inside. So something like you know the invisible skyscraper in, in, in South Korea, where they have kept uh, the, the cameras behind and then project it on the front side. So it's as if like you know you are seeing the background thing, so it is an invisible uh, skyscraper. So it's, it's something similar to that. But the, but the key thing is that you have to take that in the longer wavelength. So you, as you go to longer and longer wavelength, you can study what is behind or what is inside these clouds itself. Now, why these, these sources are important? Sources are important because these are the regions where stars form. You know, you find baby stars inside this. this. But, the, but the thing is that to see those baby stars, you have to go to the infrared or the longer wavelength, not in the visible. So this is called the Bernard 68. It's a kidney-shaped cloud, as you can see the, the shape of the cloud itself, right? Bernard 68. Bernard is a basically a you know catalog name. And if you search in, in, in internet Bernard 68, you will find this source. But if I if I look at the same source, you know, here it is, it is a hole, but if I look at the same source in far infrared. The same object is emitting light now. So you see the importance of multi-wavelength, you know, study of these sources, right? In one, you see them as ports, but when you go to another wavelength, you see them as emitting substance. So if you want to study these sources very carefully, you have to do multi-wavelength observations. Here's the problem. The problem is that if you go to, if you put a telescope in the ground base, uh, in, 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 in the ground, uh, somebody was asking that, you know, why can't we go to space? Um, so the thing is that, you know, so these gray things are where the radiation is getting absorbed. And this white is where the wavelength, the, the wavelengths are permitted by the atmosphere. So if you look at here, you can see that the visible part and some of the near infrared and mid infrared regions are what Earth is actually allowing to come in. Otherwise, if you want to study in UV, you have to go outside. You have to go to space. So that is basically because of you know the ozone which is there in the atmosphere. It absorbs the, the UV. So the same thing which protects us is actually it's not good for the astronomers. So you have to put a if you want to study the universe in UV wavelength, you have to go to space. Likewise, you know, you can see the there are other bands here, and the main culprit is the water vapor. So that is the reason why if you want to study sources in infrared or far infrared, you have to go to sites which are like very dry, it's like Hanle or Chile, and where the water vapor content is very low. So Hubble, when it was you know, launched in 1990, has given us a glimpse of you know, the world which of unimaginable, you know, um, a scale. For example, you could get uh, you know a planet revolving around the star. You could see the Schumacher-Levy 
hitting the Jupiter. You could see the regions of star formation where you can see that the young stars are found on the tip of these regions where it is giving out these high, high energetic outflows. This is a dying star which is exploding. You can understand what are these, you know, those network of elements that you see in the dying star as it as it explodes. The sombrero had, had galaxy, the dark lane of, of, of uh, the dust. You can you can see that, and of course the deep field, uh, you know, the image that is taken by Hubble. So Hubble has given us, you know, a lot of information about the about the universe. So there are other space telescopes also in in uh, yeah, when you look at it in different wavelengths. For example, in ultraviolet we have this uh, this astrosat. There were other uh, you know uh, telescopes put for for measuring the radiation from the from the infrared. For example, Spitzer, and this is the size of the you know primary mirror. So you can see that. The primary mirror was so small that the intensity is very, you know, the, the sensitivity of these telescopes are, are really, really low. So you can sit here. And now with HST, of course, it's, it's bigger, but you see the JWST going to be much, much bigger. And it's going to, you know, go from visible light till the, till the infrared. So this is the size of the JWST to put it in, in perspective. For example, if you look at the, the Hubble Space Telescope primary mirror, it's about two meter in size and it is monolith. Basically, it's a single you know, blank. Whereas if you go to JWST, there are 18 segments uh, um, which makes up the, the primary mirror together. Now, if you look at the Galileo's telescope, and you look at the Hubble, they are all like, you know, a tube with, you know, the refracting, uh, you know, optics inside or reflecting optics in the case of Hubble. But when it comes to JWST, it's a very peculiar shape, right? It's like something is projecting out and there are these, these you know, sheets being put somewhere. So it, it's, a, it's a completely different from the idea that we have in our mind. Okay, so, so I'll come to that, why that is so. Now, you, 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 if, you, if you look at a small body uh, in a two-body system, so basically it's a three-body system, and if you, if you see that object which is at a 60 degree from the, from the line joining the sun, for example, here, sun, Jupiter, and the third body somewhere here. Now, the, according to physics, they, they, these objects will be locked up in these positions. Either they will be behind, if it is going around like this, they will be behind Jupiter or they will be ahead of Jupiter. So these are the bodies which are called trojans or, or greens. Basically, this comes from the dynamics. So if you put an object, it will be locked in these positions. This was first put forward by Lagrange. Um, and, uh, and the reason for, because he found it, so this is called the Lagrange points. Now, there are five Lagrange points in, 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 for example, Earth Sun system. Now, one uh, L1 is in between the Sun and the Earth. So, if you, if you draw a straight line, um, three points will come along those lines L1, L2, and L3. L1 is in between Sun and Earth, L2 is far away, L3 is behind the Sun, and L4 and L5 are two other meta stable regions. So basically what this tells you is that if you put a source here, you know, they will stay there. It's, it's basically, it's a stable one. But if you look at this image very carefully, this is a 3D kind of thing. So there is this potential and this is like, like a ridge. So you keep something here and a slight perturbation can put it, put the source here or here. So you need some fuel to, to keep that in, in that equilibrium position. But uh, our Aditya L1 is going to be here because that is a good place to always look at the sun, right? Now, the, the JWST actually has gone to L2, okay? But it's not that it's very stable. Now, you can ask me a question that, okay, L4 and L5 is also stable, right? You can put, the, put your telescopes there, there also. The problem is that L4 and L5 are stable regions, 
So there can be other objects which are there. So you cannot put a telescope where you don't know what all objects are already there. It can collide and destroy your telescope. So unless you map out all the objects, you cannot put a telescope there. So JWST is, is actually put it in the LGBT. Now, was to, it by mistake or was it by mistake you put it there or was it by text? No, no, no. So this is the best location where you can put it. You cannot no. put it here and here because not L1. Oh, L1, because then you, you are towards the sun. No, you don't want that. If you want to study the sun, then you put it in L1. Yes, once we outside. Yeah, then you, you have to be away from the sun. This is the, uh, you know, the distance, to put the distance in perspective, the sun and earth is about 150 million uh, kilometers, whereas earth and, uh, you know, the James Webb is 1.5 kilometers, million kilometers. Now, what you see, the James Webb is like this, but you cannot send it like this because you need a bigger rocket. So the, the basic thing is to fold it and then keep it inside the, uh, inside the rocket pairing, and then you fire it up, right? But the problem is that as you fire this up, you have to deploy all these things and make it bigger. So it's it's like you know a child sitting in mother's womb. So this is what you know the the James Webb when it was folded and uh, ready to put. Are you changing the slide from the? Yeah, it is changing. One slide. It's changing here. Yeah, it's changing here after the it's not the input. So this is basically, you know, this is how the James Webb was packed and it's going to go in. And we all know this famous picture. This is how this is when we saw the James Webb for the last time. Even though we are seeing the images, the wonderful images that is sent by James Webb, this is the last time when we saw it actually. So it after the launching, there was a critical uh, cr time critical event, which is the deployment of the uh, you know solar array. After that, you know it it did a lot of deployments. Basically, it took about one one month to start from the from the Earth to reach to L one, and then it took about five to six months for the people to to calibrate the telescope, and then bring to a situation where we can actually see the sources. James Webb is as big as a, a tennis court. You are in share screen, Zoom? Yes. Can you reshare it? Stop sharing. I know I will have to. So any doubts or any questions? So if it's in the L2, that means it will be in always some share of it, it will be away from, it will be looking away from the sun. It's right. not shadow. Yeah. So the only thing is, um, no, I don't think so because the angle that's subtended by Earth is so, no, nothing. It's even, it's even gone mass. Yes. Why is it that we should Yes. Oh, that's because of the. Uh, there is something called um, diffraction effect, where if you have the diameter which is bigger, then your image size becomes smaller and smaller. Excuse me. Like, that is the L coin. No, it is. So this is a free body calculation where if you have James Webb and you have Sun and Earth. Then there are this five fiducious point in space, which sort of moves around with the sun and earth system itself. Well, it's, not fixed. it's not fixed. So they all move. The all five points will move along with the earth and sun. Is it like a if, uh, 
place where the gravitational uh, forces that is true that you negate out negate out basically so it's a it's a equipotential you know the region but then uh, so that's because of the three body problem the calculations these are the regions where the the force you know the pull and push between the objects are like you know equated out so it's like um, um, you know it's like somebody is pulling from someone some place and other is pulling on the other side there will be some place where it is like you know equal, so it is because of that. Uh, how does the motion of the moon and uh, other such objects affect this? Uh, so there can be Lagrange point for Earth and Moon also. No, no, but if, if, if it's a four body problem, for example, because moon is also pretty close. Yeah. Right, it's it, right, yes. So the distance between the moon and the moon and the earth is so small that you can consider that that as a one system and then you can consider the other one yeah uh, the moon said to be moves are then away from us every year uh will that i guess Lagrange point uh, no it is not because see it the calculations all depends on the, the mass of the of the particles which we are considering and if you look at the moon's mass it's it's only a fraction, right? So it's it's not going to affect the thing much. And also, you take it as a single system. So when it's a Lagrange point and an equivalent point, so it has, it's a moving point. So that means you need to keep the telescope moving at that point at a speed which that the L L one is L two is maintained. That the speed at which it has to make it. So in space, you just give a push. We don't have to put it in. Just, yeah, I just keep moving, right? Because it's in the gravitational potential. So there's no solar energy used to. No. So only thing is when you want to maneuver it, then you have to fire the jets. That is how you use the, the fuel. Other than that, it's not. So zero power consumption in terms of in, movement up there. That is true. So the power consumption is basically when it started from the earth and it moved to L1, L2. That is all. And the and the journey was so smooth that they used very less uh, you know the fuel. They use the, the, the no, so the, the, the entire planning was so good that they don't have to use it. So now they can they also use this uh, the, the planet pull gravitational pull from other planets. There are other mechanisms by which you can you can maneuver the uh, for example, if you want to observe one source and you want to change the course, then you have to really change it, right? So then you know these things come into the situation. Is in a fixed position. So all the things are moving together. It is at, at the L2 position. It need not be because we want it to be there and there. Yeah. But, uh, water it, it won't because there are on onboard boosters which can bring it back. So there are corrections in the orbit. You have to do that because, as I said, it's not a very stable place. You need to correct the motion. There are different Lagrange points for different sorts of bodies in space. Yes, that's what I said. For Jupiter, it is different. For Earth. Um, sun system, it is different. So you can take it in a much larger scale as well, like for your solar system. You can do that, you but then you have to reach there. Yeah. It takes time, and and most importantly, you have to communicate with these systems, right? You cannot put it very far away because signal will take time to reach to us. So there is a time delay also, right? So you put it very far. For example, movement of the rovers in the Mars, you give a command, but you cannot see it's moving because the time it moves and the information comes back, there is a delay in the, so you cannot just put far away. So, why should we continue? Yes. Uh, I was waiting uh, for the why are they exactly? That is when you can pack them very, you know, tightly. If you put circles, there will be gaps, right? 
So hexagon means you can fix it, uh, you know, you can align them and then make a make a full, the filling factor will be high. Basically. Okay, so, so this is the kind of, you know, the scale we are looking at for the JWST. So what NASA said is that, you know, the most complex sequence of deployment ever attempted in single space mission. And there, there, there are 344 single point of failure items on an average. That means if anything goes wrong, even a single thing goes wrong, the entire telescope will be like, you know, will be redundant. Now that's basically because there, there are 144 release mechanisms. So you have to release the, the two uh, mirror sets which were folded in. Then you have to release the arm with uh, the secondary. So there are many such things. Now what they did is they had done rehearsals. They had the contingency plans. If something fails, what could be done? So the all the plans were tried out well before the the launch actually took place. So it it was a result of uh, you know a meticulous planning that you know this went without any problem. How many years? How many years? We'll see that. <laughs> so this is the JWST image. We took it from uh, from Kavalur. Uh, on the day of its launch. So, so 1990 was when the Hubble was launched and then they started, you know, after six years, after correcting all the problems, they, they started thinking about the next mission, the JWST. And you can see that there were, uh, you know, periods when uh, it was actually, you know, that there were threats to call off this mission. Uh, to cancel the mission, but somehow they managed to, you know, overcome all those threats. And on December 25th, uh, you know, they launched it. So it's about 25 years of hard work that has made this uh, this thing, you know, possible. So JWST, as it is, you know, deployed, like all the release mechanisms, everything is uh, deployed. There are these, uh, what is called sun shield. Uh, then there is the spacecraft bus, which has all the electronics. Then this is ISIM. Uh, there is this, all the instruments are placed behind the uh, telescope. And this, of course, is the, the mirror, uh, the optical elements, the primary mirror, the secondary mirror. And there is a treasury mirror inside, which, um, you know, uh, reflects the light towards different instruments. Now, there are several instruments kept the near infrared camera basically uh, to look at the, the continuum images of the of the celestial sources. And then there are these near infrared spectrograph, mid infrared um, camera, and this fine guidance sensors. So even if when the when the satellite or telescope is moving, there will be jitters, right? So to correct those jitters, what they use is this fine guidance uh, sensors. Basically, there are small mirrors which also vibrate in the same frequency, keeping the you know the the pointing to 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 a star or to an object very very accurate. Now, what are the expectations? The expectation is that you go beyond HST, right? And HST is taken in a visible light. So the the thing is that you want to see in infrared. That means you can penetrate through these dark planes and see the background sources as well as sources which are forming inside these dark clouds. One way to differentiate between HST and JWST images are these spikes that you see. For example, here, there are four spikes, whereas in JWST, you see six. This is basically because of the optics uh, artifacts that comes into picture. So that was used by our directors in the movies in, in with good effect. Okay. Oh, it's very. So, how many of you have seen this movie Predator? <laughs> okay. So there, you know, there is a scene where you know the Arnold is lying, and then Predator comes, and Predator actually able to see through the infrared, uh, you know, uh, sensors, but he couldn't see him basically because he was covered with mud. Okay. So his heat and the and the ambient medium was on the same temperature. Now, if you want to take an infrared image of a person, you can see the background is also emitting, you know, the same um, light. 
That means if you want to enhance the signal from the sky, you have to cut down the images, the, the infrared radiation coming from the ampule. Yeah. That means you have to cool this, this thing. That means your telescope and instrument has to be cool enough that you get the mid infrared or near infrared uh, radiation that is coming from the from the source. That's exactly what this uh, the shield does. So shield basically looks towards the sun. You can see that the sun facing side is 85 degrees Celsius, whereas the, the opposite side is minus 233 degrees Celsius. So if I if, if I take it in Kelvin, it is 40 Kelvin. Okay, how does it do that? There are five layers uh, in the sun shield, and each layer radiates the energy out in such a way that you know, as it when it comes to the fifth layer, already the, the radiation is so low that temperature becomes very less. So, so the the mechanism to cut down the background radiation from the instrument and the telescope is cleverly done using a sing, a, a a sun shield. And that is the reason why it is not a classical telescope, but it's beyond that. So it is at L2, it's 85 Celsius. That means it's that distance. That is that height? Is that the temperature that is there from the sun? Yes. That means even if it is there, still even Jupiter it might be having good Celsius, right? That is true. Okay. Because of this, our atmosphere, I don't the radiation it. temperatures, basically the radiation from the it's not from the sun. Temperature. Yeah, it's basically the radiation which comes reaches there. So if something is not facing the sun, the other region will be cooler. Yeah, it's basically it's because of the radiation. The thermometer it will be eighty five Celsius. Yes, at this distance. Oh, at that distance. Yeah. That's because, because our atmosphere is cutting off a lot of this uh, temperature, I think we are not getting that much. What do you call this process of reduction of temperature? It's, it's nothing, it's just uh, it's basically the radiator, it's just radiating out the, the, the energy that it is capturing. It's cap and radiating out so well that it's not allowing anything to pass after the fifth one. There is one that uh, this is absorbed. I didn't get you. Uh, so this energy will absorb, right? Yeah. So what is done is absorbed. Absorb it's radiating away, no? It's, it's it's radiating from the gaps which are there. So you're radiating into the space. Yes. So heat is just lost. Uh, yeah. So use. Yeah. But you need to protect the telescope from. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's a lot of uh, <laughs> slides that you yeah. have. So <laughs> you'll have questions so at the end. Keep it so I you. told it already, but please hold on. You'll have questions only at the end of the talk. Okay. So to put the temperature in perspective, if you look at the, in the temperature in the, uh, in the Antarctica, it is minus 89 degrees. Okay, so, so that gives you an idea about the temperature that we are talking about, minus 233. Now, what are these, these uh, you know, the shields made of? These shields are made of uh, Kepton membranes. So these are thinner, as thin as the human hair. And uh, this is coated with uh, aluminium, basically to increase the reflectivity. So even if it absorbs, you know, you make it one more uh, coated layer so that it reflects away all the radiation. And the purple color that you see on here, it's basically, you know, the doped silicon coating. The material is used because it is, it is hard and it can, you know, withstand the heat. Uh, the thickness of the aluminium is even smaller than the thickness of the hair. It's, it's 100 times smaller than the thickness of the hair itself. Now, Kepton is used, Kepton is used basically because it's stable across a wide range of temperature. You can see that, you know, you have to use a material which can withstand the one part of the, you know, the sun and the other, the cooler part of the, um, cooler part of the region. So you have to use the, uh, the material very, very carefully. There is one more thing. So this I said it is a tennis, uh, you know, court size, right? Now there are these fast moving particles. This can actually hit this and then it can puncture it. So if you stretch a, you know, a balloon or a rubber sheet and you just puncture it, just tear away. So to mitigate that, what they have done is they put this wire meshes, you know, very fine wire meshes. So if there is a hole, it just stays there. It won't, uh, you know, so, so a lot of careful thinking technology has gone in in making this, uh, you know. So the, the mirrors, there is this primary mirror, of course, the hexagonal one, and there is the secondary one, 
then there is a periphery mirror and the fine um, steering mirror. So this actually forms the main optical elements of GWSC. Now, the mirrors are made up of beryllium. That's basically because they're light, but at the same time, they are stronger. And uh, they can withstand the cryogenic temperature, very cool temperature where the telescope is kept. And it, it should not you know, uh, change its shape because then the image formed by this mirror is also, also going to be distorted. Now, every mirror is uh, plated with a thin layer of gold. It's about 100 nanometer thickness. And why gold? It's basically because it reflects much of the light in, in, the, in the infrared part. So it, it reflects out about 99 percentage. There is one more reason. that You don't want this 99 percentage to be lower because when something is not reflecting, that means it's absorbing. And then it emits in the infrared, which will actually enhance the background, which you don't want. So basically you need something which is as reflective as possible. And gold is not, it won't get tarnished very easily, whereas silver will get uh, tarnished very easily. Now, how much gold in this? I think some of you may be interested in this. The total gold that was used was about 50 grams. <laughs> it's about three lakhs. Okay, so this is the secondary when they, when they, when they you know, uh, installed with the telescope. So you can see the scale of the, of the, uh, you know, the, the mirror. And they, and okay, so even after cooling with this sun shield and all, they achieved 37 Kelvin, but that was not enough. You need to cool it much further, basically because to go into the mid infrared part. So near infrared, it's okay. But if you want to image systems with mid infrared, then you have to cool it much further than that. It's about seven Kelvin. Remember zero is the absolute, you know, so you, you are just touching the, the zero Kelvin um, uh, thing. Now, how they do that, how they reduce it further, they use a very clever, you know, process called Joule Thompson process. So when you expand the gases by pushing it through, you know, um, nozzles, it expands and it cools. So that is the technology used to cool the, the detectors even further. But then there is a problem. When you force something through a nozzle, it can, you know, give you a, um, emblem, I mean, uh, the, the momentum, right? Because some, you're pushing something. So what they did is they used a very clever technique called, you know, the, the cryo coolers which they used are two cylinders and they work opposite to each other. So that means they mitigate, you know, one's movement by moving the other. And this is the only moving part, by the way, in, in the entire DWSC. So someone asked, uh, you know, how they get all the, you know, uh, the lights together. What they do is they first uh, get the images from individual 18 uh, mirrors and then they co-face in such a way that you ultimately get one single image from the, the entire 18, uh, you know, segments. This is the, um, you know, the face. Uh, for the uh, instruments, you have imaging and spectroscopy in that. There are certain um, uh, coronographic, uh, you know, um, system as well. Coronograph is nothing but you block the light from a bright thing. You can actually study the fainter objects around it. This is a solar eclipse, and you can see the, the coronal emission from the sun. This is the footprint of, you know, the, uh, the regions that you see from... Uh, in the sky by JWST. And you can see that this has everything. This has a focusing elements. It has filters. It has blocks to block the light. It disperses the light using grating. So each of the web's four instrument is like a Swiss Army knife. That's everything. Whatever you ask for, it's there inside. Okay, so this is one of the uh, instruments where there are these blocks. This is how you keep the block in the field. There are these uh, arms which support that central block that is used to block the light. And this is the first result that has come out from the JWST. JWST has looked at one of the stars and, and this is HIP 65486 and they have seen the image of a, of a of a planet. And the obscuration of the primary star is so clear that you, know, you have to use an artificial star symbol to basically 
say that that is the position of the in, initial star. So it is blocked out, completely blocked out, and what you get is these uh, images of the planet. You don't worry about these uh, bars here, that they are artifacts from the optics, but otherwise, you know, you can. So this is taken in four filters. This is taken in three micron, this is four, this is 11, and this is 15. 15, so this longer wavelengths. Now, if you get the magnitudes or the flux that is coming from the planet and put them in, in a spectral energy distribution, as I already said, you can calculate the, the characteristics, for example, the temperature of the, of the planet itself. So you see, previously, people used to worry about detecting planets. Now we have moved on to the next level, that is characterize the planet. What is the temperature? What are the detailed, you know, um, other uh, uh, parameters about the planet? This is another uh, way of blocking the central light, basically to see if there are disks around the stars. And um, in, in this is famous uh, Orion star forming region. This is the closest massive star forming region to us. And Hubble has already seen several <laughs> Young stellar objects with a disk around them. And the massive so radiation from the massive sources are actually interacting with this disk. And, and you can see that they are getting distorted, basically. Now, this is the Hubble uh, image. Uh, this is the Hubble image, and this is the JWS image of one of the sources in this field. And you can very well clearly see the, the dark layer, basically the disk and the stellar image that is escaping from the two ends of the object. And what is what was startling was that this is so isolated. There is nothing, no other star nearby. So basically, the star formation is happening in isolation. There are various techniques being used to get the to study, for example, a galaxy. You know, there are ways in which you can cut the entire galaxy image and feed it through spectrographs, and then you know uh, study them differently. I will not go into detail. You can also do not a single star spectroscopy, you can do multi-object spectroscopy. So it's like getting spectrum of stars in one shot, many of the stars. And one of, this is a very, very new technique that is being used. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, um, using a slit or anything, they use this, uh, what is called, uh, you know, uh, shutters. So by opening these shutters, they are very small ones, minute ones. So you opening these shutters, you can allow the stars to go and fall onto the grating and you can take the spectrum of individual stars. And this is how you get the spectrum of many such sources in one go. I'll just come to some of the images. Uh, this is a, a Karina Nebula, uh, where, you know, this is the Hubble and this is JWST. And you can see that in Hubble, because it was looking in visual uh, wavelengths, you see a lot of obscurations, right? When nothing is seen through. But if you look at JWST images, because it is in infrared, you can penetrate into the cloud and you can see many of the stars which are found inside this. And the sharpness of the of the you know the images are quite sharp. So this will give us enormous information about how the stars are formed in interstellar medium, how the interstellar medium itself is made up of, and, and what are the, you know, the physics uh, going on. What we see is not the IR image as JWST, right? This is the JWST. But not with the colors. Because oh, yeah, yeah. So you combine and then, then you give colors to it, basically. This is the uh, pillar of uh, pillars of creation. You can see there are again various obscurations, but in in JWST you can clearly see. You know the, the number of stars that you can see in JWST. It's basically because you are penetrating through through the clouds, which actually obscure these <laughs> radiation that is coming from the background, as well as the stars forming inside. You can see this one. There's a red source, right? That is a very young star which is forming inside this star. And that is possible basically only because of the infrared uh, radiation that we are using to study this. This is another exa example. As I said in the first case, the expectations are to see more, and what you see is actually more stars uh, in, the, in the region. This is another young star where it is giving out you know, um, the outflows from the central region. 
And you can see the outflows are interacting with many of the ambient cloud itself. And 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 you know you can you can study how the variation from these sources interacts with the interstellar loop. This is a dying star. So this is what Hubble saw, and this is what uh, JWST is seeing it. You can see you know the details uh, of uh, you know around this dying. So this is a it's it's dying means it's in the end stages of its evolution. So it's just exploding and uh, throwing away the material. And how this material has been thrown out can be studied by you know JWST in much much more detail. This is uh, you know a galaxy encounters. So this is what Hubble saw, and you can see there are many many details like like star forming regions. So how galaxies when interact is leading to the formation of many young stars is what is uh, you know, and 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 what is important is. There are many fainter, you know, um, redder galaxies are seen in these images. So these are basically uh, when the light travels, it actually dilates. So it's like you know, its wavelength becomes redder and redder. So when when you see it earlier, um, you know, sources, they becomes more redder and redder. So if you see the redder sources in these images, that means they are far away. They have formed much, much earlier, very close to when you know the universe itself has formed, because the light takes uh, you know time to reach to us, isn't it? So, so the what you're looking at is the, the much early universe. This is another example where you you know this is a JWST image of the same uh, galaxy, and you can see these network of filaments basically, and the, and the bubbles that are seen. These are basically formed by the formation of very massive stars. So somebody was asking that, how can we, you know, uh, find the structure of the, of the galaxy because, you know, our Milky Way itself. Now, if you look at very bright sources or very, um, you know, massive sources, then you can look at it at far away distance, and they all will be for forming on the spiral arms. So if, if you locate those sources, then actually you can uh, draw how the galactic, you know, the shape itself is. And this is a combined image of uh, Hubble and uh, JWST. And you can see that, uh, you know, the blue, which is basically the hotter regions, are actually correlating very well with the bubbles that you see. And of course, this is the deep field. This is the Hubble deep field. And this is what JWST has produced. And you can see these, these streaks. These are basically the, the lensed images of the, you know, the closer galaxies uh, because of the gravitational lensing. And uh, this is the, uh, um, this is what uh, the furthest uh, galaxy that was detected by Hubble. And uh, you can have a correlation between the redshift and the age of the universe. So higher the redshift, uh, you are looking towards the you know the, the younger uh, universe. So the previous record was by Hubble, which is redshift of eleven somewhere you know here, the first like you know sources. But now the hub uh, JWST has pushed it to twelve point five. So maybe it can push it for much, much further and we could see what is the, you know, the galaxies forming, formed, what type of galaxies formed when the, the star and galaxies initially started forming in the universe itself. So the James Webb Space Telescope was specifically designed to see first stars and galaxies that were formed in the universe. So we are going to see snapshots of when stars started, when galaxies started, and uh, the very first moment of the galaxy of the universe. And as he says, my best bet is that we are going to see big surprises. Sorry for the jumping. Uh, thank you. Who is that? This is the uh, American intensive and the uh, astronaut. So thank you, Mahesh. Um, we'll have questions now. Please raise your hand and I will take them one by one. Yes, sir. We need to repair something in the no way. So, is there a way to bring no it back? Way. No. Okay. I think that may be something that people may think in future that maybe you dock it somewhere and then.
Yeah, then you can do the repair because uh, other needed repair, right? That is true, but it is only 500 kilometers from from Earth, so we could do that. So maybe yeah, I think what you said is you maybe you able to bring it back or something like that because it's 10 billion, 10 billion US dollars, and our 30 meter telescope is about two two billion. So you can see you know, the scale in which we are talking about. This cryocoolers. Uh, how long would they last and what happens? What so I, I asked you to raise and uh, others also. So, please, what is your question? Uh, uh, which, which is required to maintain at a certain temperature, the panels at a certain temperature. When, when would it run out? How long? Yeah, it, so maybe it is designed for a longer time. So, it's only required for the mid infrared instrument. Maybe they'll use it uh, such a way that it lasts for longer. Uh, how does the JWST point to different places? Oh, it's a good question, actually. So it, it moves by the something called, you know, uh, gyro, gyro wheels by which you can maneuver and then uh, move it. But it's a very complex process. Uh, you see the shield always has to look towards the sun. So it is only the, you know, this this is what you, are, you can, uh, you know, point to. Or you have to rotate it like this. So that is a the dead time is quite high. But I think as a revolution is completing the entire revolution around the sun, I think it itself is covering almost the entire as through the journey. It's um, it could be yes, yeah. You but have to manually mechanically change the position. Oh no, so so okay. So what they do is they plan their observations in such a way that the the movements are minimized, and then you know. Uh, based on the best position, they can actually point it. Yeah. Yeah. That's another yes, please. And, uh, images are actually artificially colored no? because all IR is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Is it uh, the wavelength? Uh, you know, what color and the wavelength correlation is there? Like uh, oh, for the reason, so on the wavelength are blue. Or yeah. So blue. normally, what we do in astronomy is that the bluer we give blue color. Uh, green is in between and the red is the longer. So you mix three three images together to form the, so that is why the images are taken in different colors. So if you want to make, uh, for example, so this one, you want to make a color composite, you, you combine them and give artificial color. You can always give color to individual images also, but when you make a color composite image, then you give it in a color coded in a such a way that the, sh the shorter, middle, and the longer is coded in blue, green, red. Uh, it's all photons, right? So they are ultimately what you get is numbers. <laughs> Then you you change it to whatever wavelength you want to see. Yes. Okay, so we saw various behaviors like they are comparing JWST with the Hubble. So why do you want to compare them? I can't you just want to tell you what is the difference between Hubble and JWST. Why can't we go further beyond like the thing? See, maybe Mr. Hicks could not different topics. Could not cover and we can go far, farther beyond that rather than uh, try to go more into the see the one of the the thing is to go into the early universe yes. how when the big bang happened when the galaxy and stars started forming what was the situation there so to understand that you have to peep into deep and that's what jw is using another thing is the planets for example Hubble could detect it. Now we are going beyond. We are going and characterizing these sources. So that's how you go forward. You know, you you know these sources. For example, galaxies. What do you want to study now? You want to make it more finer and look at it more in the details, right? That's how you want to see. It. And uh, so, if you can put place in a point, what's the distance from between the big bang to the Earth? Oh, so you? I can tell you in terms of uh, age is thirteen billion years. Yeah. 
and uh, such part of the and uh, it was put in some place like so how far the place you is can convert it with the velocity of the light right yes. you know the velocity of the light i have given you the time that it has taken convert it back so to whatever unit you want you want in kilometers you can put it zero so and then when did happen in some corner of the universe and it happened in the universe was very small so it happened everywhere practically so that's all it was it's a, right? it was a point so you can't say how far is that from that point right it was all within it was a point the universe itself was a point what we can tell you is that when big bang happened that's the age of the universe yes. right say where uh, you can say that. You can actually calculate what is the time taken for. Yeah. Yes, please. This telescope, is it always taking snapshots, or is there any concept of like a stream, almost like a video that cuts up there? So, there is something called exposures, right? So, the flux that you get from these sources are like, you know, I said luminosity, right? That is the flux per second. Basically, it is giving out photons per second. Now, it all depends on how much signal or above the noise that you want. Okay, for that, you need to give certain exposure time to, to stare at that. So it's not a video, you just because video is not going to give you any, any much information unless it is a transient. There's something happening which is changing with time. For example, planet going around a star. It's moving, right? So what you want to do is you take an image in time and then see how it is moving. And other than that, to increase the flux, you need to keep staring at that source for a longer time, depending on the signal itself. Yeah. What is the difference between EMP and Ask him. <laughs> A PMT is a 30 meter telescope. So the primary mirror is going to be 30 meter. JWST is 6.5 meter. TMT is going to be in ground. JWST is in sky. TMT is going to see the universe in visible and infrared. JWST is seeing in infrared and mid infrared. There are many differences. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> So Hubble was maybe sent for five or 10 years. Now it has lived longer. So maybe JWST will also live longer because as I said, the fuel that it required for going from Earth to M2 was not much consumed. So it has enough fuel to last for maybe 15 years or so. And what would be the mirrors as well? Yeah. To align the mirror and the fuel be used? No, no. That is like, you know, all because every time we keep focusing. No, no. So once you co-phase it, the mirrors are like done with. It's a one-time event. Yeah, it's a one-time event. Can you see the infrared telescope? Near infrared and uh, visible part also it looks at, but only the redder part. Near infrared and mid infrared. So basically, any one of the telescope is going to look into the ultraviolet. No. You can do that. So the, the detector technology will change. Okay, for example, if you're going to far infrared, then the, the cooling mechanism, the detector, uh, you know, the technology, everything changes. So it all depends not only on the on the mirror or anything, but depends on the detector that we use also. Because if we know that we can further go beyond this kind of yeah, so for, I, Ultimate instrument would be with something which can look from you know gamma to uh, to the radio, but then but then the the technologies involved are different. Yes, please. Uh, Sorry, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. Quite so what do you think? No, no, no repair missions are possible. That's what I said. The only way you can do is maybe bring it back. But that's, I don't know. You have to plan for all these things. Because this is a first one. I, I think this will give us a lot of learning in the next one, what to be done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, 
galaxies. Yeah, uh, you don't have to go very far away for that matter. For example, star formation itself, right? How the the planets are formed around the stars. Okay, how uh, the the star formation inside these clouds are happening. All those theoretical uh, calculations requires parameters to very accurate level. And that can come from these these measurements. Uh, even the earlier galaxies. You can now go and find study them much more carefully. Identifying is one thing, but studying them is is another. What we are doing now is identifying them. Yes. In JWST telescope, what happens is we have 18 segments of the mirror. But if one of the segments of the mirror does not work, how will the pictures be taken? So your sensitivity will go down because your collecting area has gone down. Also, it will have effect on the image quality that you are seeing. But still, you can get the pictures. You can still get the pictures, but yeah, there will be maybe some problems. Some losses. Yeah, yeah, some losses, not much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, how does it actually, you know, uh, the, there are many mirrors, right? So, how are they placed in a way that they can, you know, uh, capture the light? So, it's a reflecting surface, isn't it? Yeah, right. Now you have to co-face in such a way that there is no breakage in the... You understand wave friends? No. Okay. So it's like, you know, uh, there are these actuators behind which can actually push and change the, uh, you know, the orientation of these mirrors. So you, you, you change the orientations in such a way that they all come in a co-face manner. Co-face means when some light is falling onto it, it all focuses to one point. The so whole thing acts like concave. one mirror. Yeah, it is like a concave, but but the important thing is when we say co-facing, it means they it will be looking like a single surface. Smooth okay, surface. It looks straight, but it's not it focuses the it's not straight, it's a curved surface. So each individual itself, there will be a curvature basically to focus the light towards. Okay. Yes. Can it detect a black hole? A black hole cannot be detected by any telescope. What you can detect is the, the emission that is coming from around it, basically. So you have to go into the, the wavelengths where you know the, the particles are emitting. The another way is as uh, the previous speaker uh, told you that. If there is a black hole, then the stars around it is going to react to the presence of black holes. They will be moving faster because of the gravitational potential of this. Now you use adaptive optics or even use JWST to pinpoint those sources inside and observe it for long enough that we can measure the movement of these individual sources. And then you can predict them, analyze it, and see how fast they are moving. And from there, you can you can actually find out it. The 2020 Nobel Prize was for for that. Yeah. Well, so right now we've got pictures of the planets, but what does it take to penetrate inside the planet and actually look at the surface? Uh, pardon? Can you just repeat? What does it take to get pictures inside the planet and look at the surface? So you see with great difficulty, you're looking at the planet itself, right? Now, if you really want to uh, cut the light and look at it, you need much higher resolution. The immediate requirement is to look at the atmosphere of these planets rather than looking at the surface, because that will give us an idea whether a life can, can sustain there or not. Now, to... to so the one of the, the, the biggest questions that we are tracking is whether life is there around, right? Now, life cannot be in any planet. It can be in something called habitable zone. So there is a sweet spot from the central star where you can have planet which can sustain the atmosphere. Now, the idea is to go and look at those planets 
study the atmosphere of those and see if it can sustain the, you know, detect oxygen or something like that, and then say that, yeah, it can. I think it was uh, six, uh, six months after the Shima launch, that, that spot, no, one star with spikes. That was the first image which was deemed or which was given to the people actually. I mean, they might be seeing the, the images because they will be doing all this uh, testing and all, right? But given to the public, I think it was after six months. Does India have access to those images? No, so there are two PIs, two people from India who are part of uh, major, uh, you know, programs with JWST. So they will have access to their programs, but we don't have, but this, these data will be publicly available. So I think after some time, anybody can use it. Uh, this data that is collecting, is it sent in real time to what are uh, or is it, is there some storage or computer? No, it, there must be storage because uh, say the, even for Hubble, for example, if the thing is going around, then it has to come into the visibility of the stations to download the data. And also it depends on what is the data collected and what is the downloading speed. So maybe it require many such you know, rotations to get. But in the case of L2, you are actually always in communication with the. So maybe, so I don't know the details of that, but there, there has to be on board the storage, storage and maybe processing also. You don't want all the data to come in. Uh, maybe initially they might require to test it, but not after some. Yes. How far is JWST? It's 1.5 million years, a million kilometers. It's quite far. 1.5 million. Yes. One, 150 is for the sun and the. Well, thank you for the presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as I ask the visitors, what do you feel most excited about the next eight and even three? The JWS. What, what do you imagine? This? The planets that you're seeing now, you're, you're not detecting them now, you're characterizing them. And maybe, you know, you find something which is in, as I said, habitable zones, which, which might host, uh, you know, uh, uh, any life of any form. The early universe, for example, for me personally, I work on star formation. I'm very interested in the low mass star forming regions and high mass star forming regions how these star forming, you know, process happens. There are many, many problems actually, because it's not, when you look at the picture, it's not that, you know, so what we do is you look at them and then you explain with the knowledge of physics that you have to basically model what is happening there. So uh, uh, one simple question is, there are stars with different masses, right? One solar mass or even lesser than that to 10, 100 solar mass. Why is it that stars are forming different masses of, you know? So these questions may come up with, you know, uh, and surprises. That is the most exciting part of all these things. You know, astronomy is a facility driven science, basically. And that is why technology has a lot, uh, you know, major part to, to play in it. You see, till it, when it reached L2, Astronomers are like, you know, <laughs> it's all technology that has taken to there. And then our job starts, basically. So it's not only, like, excitement is not only in the astronomy.
extremely important. So it's the thing. Um, just an amateur astronomer. How can we get into this? So there are, uh, you know, um, So this image itself, this was the image given to people in JPEG form. There were many people who were analyzing this image. You, you might not even see there are outflows because there are stars falling in these regions. And these young stars give out outflows, bipolar outflows, energetic outflows. And these outflows can be seen in these regions. So there are amateur people who are hunting for all these things and, uh, and finding out. So, so you can actually, you look at uh, maybe Hubble Deep Field okay. uh, when it is available to you. Maybe you uh, you come up with softwares by which you can find out the radar sources. There's so many of them. So you can actually do many things. It's the idea that is more important. And right. Sorry, this must be me. But what actually ISS is doing there? The International Space Station, what is it? What is that doing there then? I think there are many other experiments, for example, which is what they conduct over there. So, so basic thing is if a human is in, in space or in isolation, how he can survive or things like that. Then in microgravity, how you know so, uh, many things behave, for example. So there are experiments which are of different class. Now, um, on Chinese space station, uh, we are thinking of putting a small telescope. It is already there. So as it goes around, it can scan the sky and give you data. So we are going to Huh? When you say we are thinking of putting it, uh, is that like India as well? Or? Uh, India, um, so IA is also part of that. Planning to they but, uh, allow you to put instruments there. Not, we are not launching the space station. Uh, with the instrument, they will give us space and we put it there and then do the operations. How many scientists came with and so on? Is there any instruments over there? Oh, yes. So for focusing uh, the images, they use the mid infra, uh, I think, yes, uh, near infrared camera. So basically, uh, from, from here. Uh, from here. So you co pace this mirror slowly so that you know all these images come and come together and then gives you a you know, the diffraction limited image. Yes. Uh, so, will the telescope capture any images of color from the you can use it to, uh, I think, image planets, but I don't know how it's going to be done. Sorry, I have no idea. I think you had Jupiter. Yeah, but I don't know how they call it. Whether it's calibration data, they would have to should come in as part of this. That's so that you capture that. That is true. And, uh, yeah, you can do it. So why I said was like, so this is the shield. This is the telescope. Uh, you know, so so this is looking towards the sun. So when Jupiter comes to, you know, because it goes in a plane, uh, you cannot find it anywhere. So when it comes here, maybe you can uh, see it, but it needs time. Yeah, that is why I said that. No, so in principle, it can observe anything outside the orbit, outward, yeah. but not in the Then you have to take the sun. Yeah, so you have so to keep system. in mind the shield, the sun shield which you are keeping. And uh, like you see many uh, things like on media that for the deep space space for the second life on this planet that are not oh. viewable at this. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. not life. Yeah, yeah, so you have to be watchful about these because people just make these videos to get more hits, likes, <laughs> right? And make all kind of weird claims, big claims. Uh, just figure out what is the right source of information. Do you have a news portal on astrophysics? Yeah, yeah, there is such news. 
We'll be the first to <laughs> announce it also. Yeah, announce it also. We'll be glad that everyone will be glad with the news. So, yes. Yes. That's the last question. Oh, yes. So I I told you that there is a, this dark kidney shaped cloud, right? Okay. Now it all uh, so the question is how that has formed. So it has to come from the interstellar medium. Slowly something happens and it just collects all the material, comes closer and closer. As it gets closer and closer, its density increases, right? When the density increases, it has gravity, so it pulls more. It goes closer. The pull is more, it can closer. At some point, the pressure from these gas and dust material in this cloud will not be able to withstand the gravity and the entire thing collapses. So there's something called inside out collapse. This collapse to form a star at the same time. Yeah. And star formation efficiency is not 100%. It's about 1%. So 1% of the total mass of the cloud is ending up as a star. The rest will be thrown back to the industrial and the cycle goes on. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, then let us thanks Mahesh for this very exciting and informative talk. So he has told us about a very, very complex instrument, which is, is it going to do uh, front end science? And it's also really good that all of you could come and share the development of this. So we have in IA our own YouTube channel, Facebook, portals, and other things. So please follow us. There are lines of activities, series of activities that are lined up. And you don't have to necessarily come here. At least most of our popular talks are streamlined on YouTube. So you could join and uh, enjoy those. And we look forward to meeting.